What, what is relational to me? Uh, you know, in, in Buddhism they talk about the core delusion being that we're separate, that we're individual. Um, that the source of ignorance is this idea that I am uh, apart from all of this. Relational is uh, the, the given state of things when we see clearly, when we um, develop the wisdom to attend to um, how I am constituted by uh, all of these relationships and not the delusion or illusion that I'm a separate individual acting uh, on my own will, that kind of thing. Right? So it's this ontological uh, uh, way of being, but you have to have an epistemological stance to perceive it consistently and uh, to pay attention uh, to relationship. And we're all coached in at least North Atlantic context, we're coached to pay attention to individuals <laughs> and to not see relationships or to privilege uh, individual agency and self-determination over the, the good of the relationship. So it's a, a difficult shift to make. Um, but once you begin making it, you can't really go back, right? That you, um, the awareness of the, it, the relationship is always there. The, another thing that comes to mind that I work with students about um, is that we are always in relationship even if we are not speaking. So the, the human brain and the human heart have separate electrical systems. And we know that we can measure the heart's electrical system uh, up to 10 feet away from the physical body. So that my heart's electrical system is interacting with the electrical system of whoever I'm with. And we know that those systems begin to oscillate together. That, that um, the, the rhythm of our heart uh, creates something between us. We come into alignment together. So even if we're not speaking, even if we don't want to be in relationship, our bodies, our electrical systems, are already influencing each other. So that there's this embodied dimension to relationality that, you know, in, in what I teach, uh, spiritual integrated psychotherapy and practices of care, that we create an environment with who we are as practitioner or clinician or helper, right? And that uh, helping students learn that uh, it's not so much what you do um, uh, that creates the relationship as the, the very first thing is the environment you create with who you are. Um, and that's not some uh, touchy-feely, uh, woo-woo stuff, that, that it actually is embodied, that this is embodied, relationality is an embodied practice, so that we have to attend to the way uh, we're responding physiologically to the person we're talking with and use our physicality to influence them um, in, in life-giving ways. So if the client is really anxious, we don't want to reflect or join the anxiety, but we can use our breathing and our heart rate and other things to influence the client to calm down. Often people talk about relationality as being uh, um, the way we interact and the words we use and the meanings we coordinate and um, the flow of all of that, but it, it, it begins even before we verbalize. And in fact, I would say that often the language we use is influenced by the way bodies are interacting, co-constituting each other in the moment, the, 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 um, the physiological responses, the hormone cascades, uh, uh, are we generating cortisol? Or are we generating uh, a bonding hormone? Those kinds of things, right? Which are all usually not conscious, but that we can influence if we pay attention to it. So that um, I, I like to ask students to pay attention to the environment they notice around them who who is contributing to creating this. When you have you ever met that person that you just immediately feel peaceful around? Pay attention. What's happening there? What are you responding to in that person? And how can you learn to generate that kind of energy and relationship at the very beginning? That um, you know we sometimes call, talk about it as surplus of warmth or uh, that kind of thing, but it it is. Um, it's much more about the relationship that's already going on even before we acknowledge it. There are many different ways that people um, think about or experience relationality. And so, of course, I'm speaking out of what's important or salient to me. And, and I would say another view of relationality is the intention that someone brings into an interaction or a relationship. 
and um, the shared intention for the relationship. The, um, not that there's a telos, a particular place we're going, but that we have an intention about how we want to be together. We have an intention about the sort of uh, future we want to set in motion, that we have an intention about where we focus when we respond to someone else's words, ideally, right? Uh, particularly in a, a professional or a clinical setting. Um, so I think there is a way of speaking about relationality that's more instrumental, that is um, uh, either about a sort of categorical imperative, this is what uh, we ought to try to achieve, this is the goal, this is the universal value ethic of this relationship, or utilitarian, I'm gonna relate to you in ways that get me what I need or that achieve a particular end. And, and I'm trying to contrast to that type of relation, relationality because that's still focused on individual actors um, and on uh, a commitment to um, uh, something that's not co-constructed necessarily, right? That when I speak about relationality, I'm talking about what emerges between us that can be internalized as a resource, but that something new is emerging, being created, um, uh, is um, being known through the way we interact with each other. New knowledge is being constructed that um, didn't exist before. So I, I really want um, to focus on relationality as a way of generating possibilities, as a way of responding to the way uh, the universe knows through us, right? Uh, that um, paying attention to those subtle internal movements and the, the relational movements together to help open up space for something um, that hasn't existed before to come into being. There are many layers to that, right? There are layers of trust, there are layers of power, there are layers of um, uh, ability to concentrate. If I didn't sleep very well last night and what I ate for breakfast doesn't disagree with me, it's harder to do that kind of thing. Um, but the intention is also there. In my work, in my um, psychotherapy, spiritual direction, teaching, supervision, uh, imagination and intuition are really important. Um, because those are sources of knowledge that we don't generally um, recognize or privilege. So in uh, Western philosophy, we talk about objective knowledge. I see you sitting there. I can describe what you're wearing. I know who you are. I have some privileged insight into what this object or person is in front of me. Um, and, and we talk about a subjective knowledge, which might be the way I feel about uh, what I see in front of me or the way I feel about the way you treat me and those kinds of things. And we tend to think of knowledge as objective or subjective. In Islamic epistemology, there's a third category of knowledge called knowledge by presence. And it is knowledge by which the, they would say the divine or the holy, uh, I would say perhaps the universe or being itself, knows through us, through dreams, through intuition, through imagination, through um, physical sensation, things that we perhaps aren't used to thinking to thinking about as knowledge, but are ways in which we are being known through that creates new possibilities. So for me, relationality also includes attending to those other ways that knowledge comes to us that um, are alternative epistemologies in some way, right? The, the, the discourse of social construction is really shaped by a, a North Atlantic, European, uh, traditional epistemology. Uh, but there are indigenous epistemologies and alternative epistemologies that have ways of knowing, knowledge through the heart, seeing with the eyes of the heart, that are as valid and sometimes uh, more useful uh, or more effective for what we're trying to um, uh, reach through our relationships, but we haven't learned about those things and, or we have learned to discount that way of knowing. And I want students to be able to respond to it, not as if, uh, oh, this happened, I had this image flash into my head while she was talking, so that must be what's real but to use it as information to shape the relationship and the conversation, even to share that and say, while we're sitting here talking, I had this vision of a hummingbird and the iridescent colors on it 
just interesting. What, what do you make of that, right? So that we generate, we let that be a part of the conversation when we might not know it anyway. Um, I have a client that I see who was um, very severely neglected and abused as an infant from uh, birth until about age uh, 24, 36 months. Um, and he will often say, I don't know what's happening because we have long silences in session. And he'll say, I don't know what's happening, but there's some communication going on here um, that I can't explain. Um, I can theoretically explain it, right? But it's more important to me not to give it words, but to let it happen if he finds it useful and helpful. So, um, because my theoretical explanation of it might not be accurate, it makes me feel like I know what's going on, but I can uh, honor that something is happening because of the environment we're creating together. Um, and he's not used to silence or relationships being places that are safe or where he can handle the anxiety of not knowing what's happening. But what he values is this is a safe enough space to let that happen and it changes his behavior outside of session. How do these ideas about relationality um, influence and how are they influenced by power uh, in the room or between people or among people? Um, and what is power? For me, power is not a zero sum game. It's not like you have power, therefore I don't, or I have power, therefore you don't. It is something that's negotiated uh, between us, uh, which reminds me of a funny story when I saw a therapist who um, uh, functioned from a psychodynamic perspective, which just didn't fit for me. And at one point he said, you have to accept that I am the person with power in the room. And I burst out laughing and I said, uh, if, I, if I let you do that? And he said, this, this is the arrogance I'm talking about. <laughs> We mutually decided not to work together. Um, well, that's a good story about power, right? That, that sometimes we overtly carry power into a room. We assume a role, or we assume a hierarchy, or we assume um, expert knowledge, or we assume uh, some norms that we embody that the other person needs to measure up to. Um, and sometimes that's overt, and sometimes it's covert. Um, and, and often, um, power isn't something we have or bring into the room as much as it's something that um, is attached to us in the process of relating because of past histories, because of um, socio-political realities, uh, for any number of reasons, that um, as a white man, if I walk into a room in a certain setting, I have some cultural power that other people will give me, usually. They'll defer to me. Um, I'm expected to speak first. I am uh, expected to speak authoritatively and not tentatively. I am uh, expected to um, facilitate an open space for others and invite them to speak, as if that's my role. In social constructionist conversations, there is often an embedded assumption that all discourses are equal or that uh, because I'm talking about the equality of discourses and the mutuality of the relationship, uh, that that's a universally accepted norm and experience. When in fact, the other person may not be experiencing it that way at all and may experience even the insistence that this is mutual and respectful as a colonization. And um, so one of my struggles with co social construction um, as a broader discourse, right, and the, and the ways practices get implemented is that often we don't account for power in the room sufficiently. We don't do enough to decenter uh, particular identities, particular locations, particular types of authority to let other uh, ways of knowing come to the fore. And for me, that becomes an important relational practice of not speaking first of speaking tentatively, of not using words, uh, but of trying to follow the emotional behavior of other people to mirror 
that, whether it's what I'm feeling or not necessarily, but to show that I'm here and I'm with it or that I get it. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes it means having to use the authority given to me to claim it in order to um, uh, flatten the hierarchy or to uh, create a more um, level playing field where I really mean this is more mutual. You can say those things to me and I won't be defensive. But I can't just say that. I have to demonstrate it relationally um, in a way that uh, fits that person's lived experience. Right? It also means not assume, for me, is not assuming that my experience is universal. So if I'm sitting with a student who is a Korean woman who is older than me, um, less educated than me, but with a larger family, there are all sorts of hierarchies within that, right? Mm -hmm. Gender, uh, family role, age, um, all of those things. For me to be the one who acknowledges and says, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on in the room because I can't see mm -hmm. from the perspective of a Korean woman. So if there are things I need to know that I don't get, please tell me. I can be flexible in the way I relate, but I need to honor what's going on uh, from your perspective too, that this is not a Duane normative space necessarily, <laughs> that I can shift into norms too, but I might not be aware of them. And, and um, I need, I, can I have your permission to ask questions when I sense that there might be something going on here? Or even with uh, someone who looks like me, with whom we might assume equal power to say, my sense is that culture influences this somehow and we come from different places. What, what from your culture where you grew up or where you live now or with the groups of people you hang out with um, is a part of this that I, don't, I can't see, right? So to, to actively decenter as well as passively decenter. When I was in India, the, the power experience mm -hmm. where I was not used to being in a one down what I would call a one down position, but there, there were people who often made it clear to me that that's where I was. Uh, when I had students, I would take them every Friday uh, to the American Center to view uh, film of American news broadcasts. They would wave the Indian students through and then they would make me empty out my bag. They would pat me down. They would make it very hard for me to get in. Um, and that was a power issue, right? Um, and it's related to long history of colonization and other things. And I had to learn to just accept, this is how I'm framed here. Or I often said to people, if I go to Connaught Place, I am nothing but a walking wallet. No one sees a human being, right? They see money. And uh, I remember having an argument with a taxi driver once over fares. And um, he was overcharging me. And I finally pulled out my Indian press pass and then the whole story ended, right? And I had the power in that situation because of uh, the cultural implications of this, this piece of paper that I could hurt him. And I didn't perceive myself as threatening him, but I also decided it was more important for me to win this argument than to pay him a little bit extra. I'm not proud of that moment, um, but I, I get the frustrations of being placed sometimes in a power arrangement where you're erased or you're not seen for all of whom you are. Likewise, my experience living in, in Vietnam, learning the language, I'm used to being a competent person. I have complicated ideas and feelings and I like to talk about them. And suddenly I have the vocabulary of a three-year-old. But I'm trying to have adult relationships. And not only am I trying to express my complicatedness, like a three-year-old, I can't pronounce things accurately enough for most people to take the time to understand me. And in one of my closest relationships in that um, the time I was there became the man who managed the canteen at my school because in Vietnamese culture, I was above him in age, in social status, in all kinds of things. But in terms of language and cultural awareness, I was not his equal, but he would 
he was willing to take the time to understand me and to coach me into pronunciation and to relate to me where I was as if we were equal. When we assume we're in the dominant position and we want to equalize the playing field or be mutual, we're actually creating harm. Um, and I'm remembering uh, in, in Vietnamese, uh, there are honorifics and the honorifics signal your social position in relation to someone. And given my social location in Vietnam, I would um, the appropriate pronoun for almost everyone is uh, a word that basically means child. And I was in a taxi talking to someone and I was using um, the pronoun for an equal. And the man pulled the taxi over and said, you must not use ein with me. I am M with you. And I said, oh, but I'm American. I don't get into all those hierarchies. He said, it is disrespectful of you to make me your equal. And I still can't fully understand that, but I clearly got the message that my attempts to be mutual were not received that way. And that it was a type of violence for me to insist that we, were, uh, we had equal pronouns. And so I had to learn to be comfortable using a privileged, what I perceive as a privileged pronoun for myself and what I perceive as a, a disrespectful pronoun for others because they didn't receive it as disrespect. We have to live in those complex contradictions and we cannot assume we know what it means to the people we're relating with. We assume that intention trumps impact. We do not respect when people say the impact of your practice is the opposite of what you intend. We explain away, oh no, my intentions are, which makes it good. So the inability or unwillingness or the naivete that keeps us from honoring impact over intention is really problematic. It is still a social construction of the relationship in which we're saying, my positionality and perspective is more important than yours. And, and it's mutual. I'm being mutual and respectful by demanding that you see things the way I see it, uh, which is um, a microaggression. Uh, and most microaggressions are unintentional, right? Um, but it requires a self-reflexivity of the practitioner and a willingness to learn to be curious about the other person's experience of us and not just about the other person's experience of this concept or this world or that kind of thing, but to be willing to have them deconstruct us and to reconstruct ourselves in ways that are more consistent with their experience or in ways that are more consistent with our preferred values but don't seem to us to reflect those values.